So, I'm back for part 7 of the Akora spoilers, review and ranking video series that I'm doing. And I think this is probably going to be the second last video of this series. I think the, the end of all the spoilers has happened like today and then that will probably be it. If not, one more video. But um, I don't have any reviews to make over what I've done so far. I'm pretty happy with where I've ranked things. As I've said, these kind of videos don't really need a big introduction, so let's just get into the first card. Hey, so before we get on with the rest of the video, if you consider liking the video, commenting the video, subscribing if you enjoyed it and hitting the bell icon, and also you could follow us on Facebook and Twitter if you enjoy magic memes, and also follow us on Twitch where you get to watch videos like this happen live. So yeah, let's just get on with it. Whirlwind the Thought is the first card for today, and it is a four mana enchantment and it's one, a blue, a red and a white to cast. And whenever you cast the wrong creature spell, draw a card. Now, on the surface, this really does seem <sighs> absurd. Um, but really, I've been thinking, right? Maybe these cards aren't as good as they initially seem. Like, equivalent effects of stuff like this don't really seem to be played um, because it just, your turn four just isn't doing anything. Uh, it's in Jeskai colours as well, and currently the best Jeskai thing is Fires of Invention. And this certainly is not better than Fires of Invention. And maybe that's where I'm comparing this card to. Like, is it better than Fires of Invention? No. However, you can go play Fires, play this, and then, uh... Yeah, okay, then you're in a bit of an issue, but... <laughs> but ultimately, it's quite hard to place this card any lower than a B. Even if it doesn't see play, this effect is just absurd for only 4 mana. So, B it goes. Which, I understand, um... Me saying that might seem a bit strange, considering that I wasn't overly uh, praising that card. But, uh, nah, I mean, this card is obviously insane. I just doubt whether it will get played or not. However, post-rotation, something like this has probably got a much higher chance of being played. We're on to the first Mutate card of the day. And this one's really cool, because it is a 2-mana base Mutate. Or, rather, the creature is only 2-mana in and of itself. And that's a big uh, distinction, because we've not came up to something like that as of yet. And it's Mutate is a uh, 3 mana, 1 Boros Boros to cast, and it is a 2-2 Dinosaur Cat. <laughs> but whenever this creature mutates, other creatures you control get plus 2, plus 1 until the end of turn. Um, so the thing is, is that's actually just kind of dog shit, um, and I would just never play this card regardless of it being, you know, something like that. It's probably good in like a limited factor, I mean there's very few cards that are just straight up terrible and limited, a 2 mana 2-2 two, two is kind of whatever and if you get the mutate off, you get it off, but ultimately it's just kind of underwhelming. Um, I think this is probably, oh, probably D, uh, no, probably C tier, uh, it's C, I and mean, again like C isn't necessarily usable, it's just not completely outclassed dog shit. <laughs> oh, okay, so, oh, I'm not looking, I'm really, oh, fuck. right, so, here we have Slither Wisp, which is a 3 mana, 3-2 three elemental nightmare creature, and uh, yeah, nightmare seems to be pretty accurate in what I would call this, because it's a 3 mana card with flash, whenever you cast another spell with flash, draw a card, each opponent loses one life, oh my god, um, I'm not looking forward to the amount of flash cards in this set, they didn't just get to fuck. I, maybe, maybe I just need to play Flash this format because uh, if you can't beat them, join them, and uh, fuck ever staring this down when you're actually playing like a real deck for you know like a real human. So uh, fuck whoever plays this. Um, I hate you. This card should never have been printed, and cards like it should never have been printed. Um, it goes in B. This card is clearly absurdly good. Ah, oh, fuck. A nice little bit of pack filler here with uh, Snare Tactician and it's uh, whenever you cycle a card, tap target creature and opponent controls. This is probably not a terrible pick in limited. Um, it's like a 3 mana, 2, 3 human soldier, 2 and a white to cast. Uh, it's, it's like bad, um, but it's not, like it has a use. Um, I just think that it's probably, probably D honestly. Um, if it had cycling of itself, I'd be more inclined to put it in a C, but it's it just as what it is, pack filler. On another ultimatum card, and it is Immaculate Ultimatum, and this is the Jeskai one. Two blue, three red, two white to cast. Sorcery, target player gains five life. Uh, this card deals five damage to any target, and then you draw 
five cards. Um, so honestly, I really feel like this is by far the weakest one. Um, like, so as an example, there's plenty more effect, like drawing five is good, but using your entire turn seven to draw five cards, like gain five life, deal five damage, like yeah, it could end the game or it could just literally do nothing. Um, the thing as well is you draw five cards, uh, if you have three cards in your hand, it sure replenishes your hand. Like, maybe I'm underselling this card and I don't see how incredible it is, but this just seems, out of all the ultimatums, the worst one. This is obviously, like, B-tier card. You can't say it's worse than that, but at the same time, it's not an A-tier ultimatum. Um, I would actually be inclined to put this in the high C-tier of cards. Um, I'd, like, again, draw five's insane. Draw five for seven isn't really that insane. And this is, like, gain five life is, like, basically irrelevant. Um, so yeah, this one kind of sucks so much, yeah. Mm. So, I'd be putting this in high C if I was able to create the high C tier, but I couldn't add another tier. So, into B it goes. Still not a bad card by all means, but it's, um, you know, you just compare that to any of the other ultimatums and it's just kind of shit. So the next card's pretty funny, actually. It's Unpredictable Cyclone, and um, for 5 mana, 3 and 2 red enchantment, uh, if a cycling ability of another non-land card would cause you to draw a card, instead exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a card that shares a card type with the cycled card, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. So, this is immediately like, you just get free shit, and I think that's really, really cool. Um, I mean, more than anything, this is probably going to be an EDH card, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, like, it's definitely going to be fun to jank the fuck out of somebody with this. Oh, I'll cycle this card, just get a free big guy! Or <laughs> just get like a free mental enchantment. I think this is really, really funny and it's good that it has cycling in of itself. It's not a good card, but at the very least it's a card that sparks joy and has that Marie Kondo effect. So I think that I can probably put Unpredictable Cyclone into C. I would put that into the high C because uh, frankly, like it has the cycling effect itself and it also, you know, gets you free stuff, free things, good. Free stuff is on the list of good things. So we got Winota, Joiner of Forces, which is a four mana legendary 4-4 four, four human warrior creature, and it is a two and a red and a white to cast. Whenever a non-human creature you control attacks, so it doesn't count her, look at the top six cards of your library, you may put a human creature card from among them onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking. It gains indestructible till the end of the turn, Put the rest of the cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. Uh, personally, personally, I think this card's dog shit. <laughs> um, I think it's a really underwhelming mythic. It just, like, its effect is, like, technically good, but it's, like, an effect that can potentially whiff. Uh, and obviously, you do build your deck around certain cards, don't get me wrong, but, like, I, off the top of my head, anyway, I can't think of a human creature that you... that can really break this to like any kind of like fun usable extent. It's like a four mana guy uh, that doesn't do anything the turn it comes in. If it had haste, maybe, yeah, if it had haste. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have haste at all. Um, I'd, I'd say like, you know, you could arguably make this like a, like a two four and give it haste or something, you know, you know what I mean? Um, the problem is as well, is that it also requires another non-human creature to be attacking. So even if you did give her haste, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I, I really do feel like this card is like super underwhelming. Honestly, C tier mythic? I, 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 I'm genuinely feeling this C tier mythic. I do not see this card seeing any kind of play. Um, let me check the comments and just see if I'm missing something. Uh, no, it looks like I wasn't missing anything. Uh, this seems to be pretty much an EDH card that you have to build around. Like, cool, legendary creature. That kind of makes more sense given, you know, what it does, but... Yeah, I, I really genuinely have to put this in C because the amount of like, it's so irritatingly restrictive to your deck. So like, you have to look at the top six cards of your library, find a human in it, but you also need to deck a whole bunch of non-humans in order to make this work. Now, people were saying that you can play stuff like has the Marshall and stuff that makes things that are non-human tokens. Sure, but like, those cards aren't really that good. Like, they're fine, but yeah, that's uh, it's, I ain't feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. 
So if you have a problem with this pick, uh, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You can put it in the high C if it makes you feel any better. So here's one that I actually think is a lot better, and it's Kinnon Bonder Prodigy. Um, it's two mana, just a green and a blue to cast. Whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, add one mana of any type that permanent produced. So I think this is really cool because it essentially like doubles all your mana dorks, uh, or indeed like it doubles your uh, artifact, you know, mana rocks. There we go. <laughs> now also has the other effect of Pay 7 mana, look at the top 5 cards of your library, put a non-human creature card from among them onto the battlefield, put the rest in the bottom of your library, and random order. Now, when you realise that this, like, doubles... Um... Now, when you realise that this can, like, double your mana producing things, the 7 mana ends up becoming a lot less, hence why I guess they made it 7 mana. Um, this seems, like, way better to build your deck around because you don't need to, like have a bunch of humans to be able to attack to get the non-human this you just play this in a deck that has non-humans and then you just like bang whiff a fucking guy onto the board or pull a guy onto the board he's whiffing the exact opposite of that but like yeah you see where i'm going with this i think this is uh much much better i would definitely put this in b tier at the very least um hopefully someone can find a way to uh break this but currently I am definitely liking the card, uh, way, 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 extremely, extremely more than the other one, so NB it goes. Bit of pack filler for you, and we've got a common mutate, so that's, this is probably going to be needed, because if all the mutate cards are like of higher rarities, then if you get like a good one, then you can't really draft into mutate unless you super high roll, um, but this one is a fox bird, amazing alt and art, and it is a, a it's called Volkbeat. So it's 4 mana, 3 no white to cast, and it is a 2-3 foxbird creature with a 3 mana mutate. So it's quite nice when the mutate cost is, you know, one's less than the other anyway. So it's got flying, so that's cool. Um, immediately you've got a mutate guy with flying, that's decent, and whenever this creature mutates, put a 1-1 counter on it. That's kind of bad, but the fact that it has flying makes it semi-usable. Again, like this is still like a D-tier thing, because you can just mutate anything onto a flyer, so that's not really a big... Uh, Big point, but I think for being a common, it, ugh, it's hard for me to place. I think it's probably, yeah, I think it's probably a D tier. It's like it's it's, it's as good as the other D tier mutates, and just because it's common doesn't make it any better. We got lead the stampede now, which is a three mana green sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library. Reveal any number of creature cards from among them. Put the revealed cards in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So here's the thing, right? Green is absolutely swamped with cards like this, and none of them see play at all. Uh, the only one that I could remember really seeing play was, um, at least for green anyway. And this is in standard, just in the period of time that I've played, there's probably cards like this that have seen play. But um, it's the two mana one where you look at like, the top three and add like a permanent. Uh, that seems like way, way, way better. Um, there's just so many cards like this, and now, admittedly, you get the chance of just like three mana add five, sure, uh, which is unlikely. I mean, you'll probably add like two, which is like fine. It's basically draw, but it's also not draw. And because of that, it's just, it's really hard to recommend cards like this. However, in limited, certainly, certainly good. Um, the thing is, though, is it's definitely better than a D tier card. So it does go into C kind of by default because it's not totally terrible. Um, but I just don't really see these cards being like, they're never going to be like competitively viable. Something I will say is that, like, you know, in, like, an adventures deck, this is certainly quite good. However, I feel like I would much rather just play, like, Return to the Wild rather than this and still play the Incubation. I would never play this over Incubation. Incubation is way too good just for, like, a turn one. Um, turn three, you kind of want to be start, like, actually playing your guys. So, again, like, yeah, you could just stock up on adventure guys, but realistically, Return to the Wild does that, and it does it a hell of a lot fucking better. So... It's just hard to recommend. So here's a card that on the surface seems good. There's tons of like two mana like black removal in this set. But this one is like kind of shit. Like it, this will not see competitive play simply because the there already is just better version to this card. But it's easy prey. So it's two mana um, instant and it's uh, one and a black to cast. Destroy target creature with converted mana cost two or less. And it's got cycling two. Um... 
I just don't really see why you'd ever play this over the, um, like the Krulak card or whatever, like there's the two mana like Kelly guy with a counter on it. I just, I just don't see why you would play this. Um, yeah, I, I think it's like a C tier card, sure, uh, but it's not particularly great. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about it, like there's just there's very little that you really can say about it. Realistically, it's some removal and limited. Next we got Porky Parrot um, and the alternate artist fucking hilarious. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> so it's a, it's a four mana, uh, three four uh, bird beast creature and it's three and a red to cast and it's got a three mana mutate, sure. And it goes uh, tap, this creature deals X damage to uh, any target where X is the number of times this creature is mutated. Again, that's bad, um, but I do like the fact that if something has death touch, you can mutate this on it and then tap it immediately and just death touch a guy. So that's like technically fine and will certainly come up in uh, limited. So this is going to be like a very good limited combo. Um, just mutate this on a guy who has death touch, you can give shit death touch with the counters. Bang, kill a guy, bang, kill a guy. It's pretty cool removal. Um, and I'm like happy to put this in C uh, simply for that. But ultimately, that's that isn't very good. Um, but it is what it is. So now we come to the real meat and potatoes of this list. And it is the next five cards that I will just sum up with uh, the one that I like the art the most. It seems to be this one. Oh, God. So we've got the new land cycle and I've told us about it and it is essentially uh, triple mana tap lands with cycling three but they also count as island mountain plains or you know the respective land types which means they are searchable from search lands um well fetch lands but the the thing is is that people are going nuts over them and i get that there's not been many like triple colored land cycles and do not get me wrong they are obviously good but they are not like insane. Um, I think having cycling three makes it just that little bit less usable. Coming in tapped makes it a little bit less usable. I mean, obviously it has to come in tapped, but like, I don't like tap lands. That's kind of the thing. And tap lands generally aren't very good. So <laughs> it's, it's quite hard to get like overly excited. Um, would I actually prefer a scry? than Cycling 3, that's that in and of itself is actually a difficult choice to make as well. Um, like, I bet there's, there's gonna be, people probably slate me for even saying that, but I would maybe perhaps prefer the Scry because Cycling 3 is quite expensive um, and there's a huge difference between a Cycling 1 or 2 to a Cycling 3 as far as I'm concerned. Um, of course, you need to get them, but would perhaps I don't know, like, bolt lands where you take three damage for it to come in untapped. Um, I don't know if that would be fucked, but here's another thing that I do want to make a point in. And uh, I know that people are going to say this is super ill-informed, but as far as I'm concerned, um, triple coloured lands aren't really going to make that big a difference. Because really, when you think about it, um, people build their decks so uh, it very rarely, or you should be building and playing, so it's as if the colour of your lands don't really matter. Uh, especially when you take like, I mean, mono red for an example, you just play all mountains, you don't even play anything that comes untapped, and it basically plays exactly the way you need it to. Like, there's there's no mana issues or anything like that, and the deck just marks you turn four. Um, so I don't really think having lands that come in with like, has the option of three colours really in a competitive sense uh, counteracts coming in tapped. You maybe play like a few of them because it gives you like flexibility but even that, that flexibility is only useful if you see it like straight away. Because um, otherwise when you've got like a few turns rolling like the amount of, like the mana colours that you have for the most part like it might come up where you go oh I tapped wrong or like oh I needed one more mana of extra colour. But that's very rare. Now, understand, yeah, uh, it might be rare. Uh, and then you go, well, this counteracts that rare case. But at the same time, you then go, well, yeah, sure, but it means playing lands that come in tapped. And uh, that's just bad. So I'm kind of torn. Like, I'm kind of torn. It, they're obviously good. Don't get me wrong. But really, what makes them so much better than what we currently deal with in terms of how we fix our lands. 
I don't know if this really is going to make things better. Perhaps because they're like fetchable, this opens up to like maybe like four or five colored like control decks in modern. Um, I, I don't know, but even at that, you know, I, I can't really uh, say yes or no to that realistically. Um, I don't think anybody's really saying that these are like fucked, but it's definitely, they're definitely cool. And uh, that is my big uh, rant on these. Now, oddly enough, moving on from these guys, uh, so obviously uh, these go straight into like B, um, like can't, can't put them any less than B, they're all B cards, and they, I mean they will see play uh, no matter what, but I just don't think people are going to be decking play sets of all three, um, well, all five sorry, I, I just don't see that happening. But the next card on the list however, um, I actually think is uh, slightly better than these lands, and now we have a generic um, Castle Lockwin. That is what this card is, basically anyway, and uh, I think this card is pretty good. Uh, castle Lockwin being the best of the castles, and now you have a land that just lets you just does the same thing basically. It's uh, it's pretty good. It's, I, I like this card a lot. This will probably be probably like three or four quid or something like that because. Uh, Pretty much any deck can run this, and uh, that's that's only a good thing. Doesn't come in tapped. Uh, so yeah, I quite like uh, Bondo's Enclave for sure. Um, I think I'd, I'd need to put this card into B as well. Um, if this could tap for a color, it'd be like an S tier. Uh, but obviously, it's just a it's a very solid B choice. And with that, it brings us to the end of the video. This is probably. Uh, I mean, I've not edited it, it was probably a little bit shorter than the other videos as of late, but tomorrow should be uh, quite extensive as uh, the last of the uh, the common uh, drops are getting announced today at the very least. At least it seems like that. If not, then the, the last of them will be tomorrow. Um, but there's actually a few really cool, interesting commons in the set which I'm looking forward to getting to. But ultimately, this is uh, looking pretty good. I think most, like D is going to be filled out tomorrow with all the commons and stuff, but Maybe there's going to be a few B comments, who see, I guess we'll see that tomorrow. But uh, again, if you got this far in the video, then for the love of God, please like and subscribe and comment. Uh, tell me what you think of the video and my choices and stuff. Let's get a conversation going. And I will see you tomorrow with the next video. Catch you later. Hey, so thanks for watching this video to the end. And again, if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing and hitting the bell icon if you enjoyed it. And also, if you really enjoyed it, go follow us on Facebook and Twitter if you like magic memes, and go follow us on Twitch as well, where you get to watch videos like this happen live. And obviously, that means you get to interact with us as well, and we're, we're pretty cool. You'll like us. Anyway, just thanks a lot, and we'll see you in the next video.